this interview with James Brown, a family man, minister, and sportscaster at CBS and Showtime, took place at Church of the Redeemer. Here is Pastor Dalo Shields and James Brown. Well, this morning we have someone back in the house that really is a friend of Church of the Redeemer. We love him so dearly. He's been a part of our church family for uh, sharing with us for the last several years. We took a little break because of COVID, but he's back again this year. Uh, of course, you know him from CBS Sports, CBS News, and a variety of uh, media outlets. And I'm so happy to welcome again to the platform today, James Brown. Would you give him a good Church of the Redeemer welcome? James, come on up. Welcome, my friend. Just wanted to make sure I didn't step on Terry's toes as I crossed there over. You go. You did that would great. not be a good way to start the day, would it? I've <laughs> learned that over the years myself. How are you? All is well, Pastor it's Dale. It's so good, good to see you. you. Welcome back to church. So good to have you with us. And I know this is the 11 o'clock uh, service, but um, I, I think I've done a better job of following your pastor's excellent questions. If I get off track, he will pull me back, okay? Yeah, that's great. Well, James, it's really a joy to have you, and uh, I just want to sort of dive into a few questions today that I think will provide opportunity for you to share your heart and to communicate, I believe, some wonderful wisdom that God has given you over the years, mm -hmm. and of course, that wisdom coming out in the atmosphere of media and, uh, mm -hmm. and the secular world that you work in, but nevertheless being a very strong follower of Jesus. You know, we've been doing a series for the last several weeks on friendships. I want to start there, if that's okay. And, Absolutely. and talk about the importance of friendships. I know that you have some very important friendships in your life, very close friend, Tony Dungy. You guys do a lot of ministry things together. And you've had the opportunity to observe the power of friendships, positively and negatively. So take a few moments and sort of bring us from where we've been in our friendship series up to some things that you've learned in your life about what it means to be a friend, to have friends, and to choose the right friends. You know, you mentioned my friend, uh, Tony Dungy, and he certainly has been going through some challenges because he is an unabashed follower of Jesus Christ. At one point, considered pretty much um, the heart and soul of where he's working right now, but because he is a Christian who stands on the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God. In this climate and this environment where so much is changing, um, he's under a lot of persecution and ridicule, but he continues to stand because the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So why should he be yielding, if you will, to the forces that are at play right now? In terms of friendships, um, Pastor Dale, I know that there are some who will talk about, as they've segmented the work environment, that there are seven mountains of influence, and we happen to work on a mountain in a secular world of uh, media. And in terms of friends, the way the word, by the way, everything that I do, I try to govern myself by the truth of the word of God. It's not something that changes because of different forces at work in the world today. So while I don't have a lot of friends because I need to make certain that I'm walking truthfully and according to the Word of God, I am always, to use the world's word, friendly toward everyone because it is the love of God that will bring people to the truth of God. So that is what I try to stand on. Um, but many people may not see that because if I don't believe as they believe, many people are calling a lie a truth in the world today and are trying to help us be convinced that what we know is the truth, is a lie. Those are the kind of forces at play, but it's all been pointed out in the word. So I don't have many friends, but I am friendly. I use the example of having met um, Bill Russell, the former great uh, Hall of Fame uh, basketball player, God bless him, who passed. And, and in a humorous fashion, I was blessed to moderate a big event up in uh, New England, and they had a lot of their sports stars there, including Bill. And he was saying he didn't have a lot of friends. He had a small circle of friends, people he called friends because he knew them, relationship being a key word there. And I said, well, Mr. Russell, suppose you met somebody that you'd like to have in that circle of friends. What would you do? And he gave some serious thought to it for about 15 seconds and said, well, somebody's got to go. You know, so the point is, we ought to have a tight circle of friends as well. So that's great. So you have to be very careful who you bring around you because those influences really set the future of your life. True. Absolutely. Those influences have to set the future for your life. Look, even as 
a grizzled old neighbor, my neighbors are here that hell makes. Um, the point is, I hope that I am the sum total of what I've learned in the word of God. God's word is true. For instance, he even points out to us, I was gonna say warns us, and especially for young people who, gosh, your daughters, Christy and Jessica, and your wife, Terry. Two weeks ago? Last week. Ho last, holy cow. They were evangelists. We took a lot of notes from them, so they were on point. Between and last week and this week, I'm not sure I'm going to have a job any longer. So, <laughs> no, no. Hey, but they just show the beautiful godly influence that you have on them. But the point that I was going to make about Terry, Christy, and Jessica is that there are parameters within which their children have to operate. Claudia certainly knows that with her kids as well, too. Kids are learning from us. Can they not see the word of God in us? And there need to be, I think, lesson number four in your Friends series, boundaries. So my boundaries are in the word of God. God says in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, that um, be not deceived, evil communications corrupts good manners. If you're hanging with the wrong people and you're not leading them to the Lord, you will be influenced by what they are doing and what they're saying that is not honoring your parents, per what the three evangelists in your family uh, said just last week, but certainly we're not following the word of God. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, as, as being in the world of sports, obviously you're you're watching a lot of young people that mm -hmm. come into uh, the professional uh, sports realm, and they're uh, sort of influenced greatly by fame and fortune, and sometimes and by people that surround them with the wrong agenda. And in that regard, what have you seen? What warnings have you picked up just by observing some of the young people who said, yeah, I finally made it to the, the NBA or the NFL or wherever the case might be. And, and then they find themselves being destroyed by the very thing that was a goal for their life because they surrounded themselves with the wrong people. The fame and fortune is to be God honoring your lifestyle. I tell the athletes all the time. Now, my wife, she taught me what tithing was many years ago, so we're trying to get to the level that we're supposed to be, and I'm following her lead, so I am a well-trained husband. But to the point about fame and fortune um, in the world of sports, it is to be God-honoring, because the moment that you think that it's all about you, you are feasting on the lusts of your own desires, and they're not honoring him, God says what? To bring the first fruits of all that we are blessed with into the storehouse so that there might be meat to feed the folks. But many folks, they're accumulating a lot to feast on the lust of it for themselves. Just last year, um, the star running back, I mean, it's in the paper, so I'm not speaking out of school here. Um, and I won't call his name, but you may know. Anyway, so he's got all these sports cars. He's doing exceedingly well. His family is looking forward to being blessed with all of their hard work. And he knew of the Lord. But so he gets a sports car and he goes out. We're to obey the law. The book of Romans talks about what our role and responsibility is in terms of following the law. The book of Hebrews talks about following the law of God and making sure that there are one. Well, he goes out and he is driving within the city limits and just on the outskirts at 120 miles per hour. There's nothing good about that. He winds up killing some people, innocent folks in another car, and I don't remember all the particulars, whether someone in the car with him died. Just horrific. Now, he's got to pay the price for that. God didn't do that. That was his action. Those were his actions. What does he do? After being sentenced, he calls somebody who he knows is modeling the word of God. He called Tony Dungy on his own to say, I departed from the way in which I was raised. I know better. I went afoul of the word in addition to the law. I would like for you to help me to get me back on track. That is not an atypical story in the world of sports, but those who are governed by the word of God are doing the good things and the right things. Yes, that's really good, yeah. In 
in the world of professional sports, Hollywood, all the areas of where you see a lot of the glitter, the celebrity status of so many people, you will hear oftentimes on award shows or people receiving certain uh, accolades, them give credit to some spirituality, some aspect of God, some aspect of, uh, at least verbally, saying something to that effect. But oftentimes it rings a little bit, it seems to ring a bit hollow because it, there doesn't seem to be much behind that. Spirituality is something that's very popular in today's world. What would you say is the difference between what people would identify as being spirituality or even sometimes something about God but lacks the depth of life change and life commitment along with it? Okay, so you play along with me. You're the deep theologian here. So finish the sentence. So our God, God the Father, is what kind of a God? He is a jealous God to you were talking about those who are referenced some other kind of God. I have learned as a result of being taught and digging into the word of God, making it the first thing that you do in the morning, as he says in his word, seek him first so that we are hearing from him to govern us. But he also sharpens our ability to discern and to hear. So when I was working in Hollywood, uh, many of the award shows, we would hear people get up and they would give thanks to God. Okay, before I used to react to that superficially until I had to read and understand that people are referencing a whole bunch of different kinds of gods. Or they say that I'm a very spiritual person. There are a lot of different spirits out there. Who is it that you're following? What God are you talking about? So if I'm blessed to get an award, it is not intended to be trying to show that I'm holier than thou or to be condescending or disrespectful. If they can do it, well, let me say, I'm honoring our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is crystal clear who it is that I'm talking about. And quite frankly, I was blessed to go over to Israel uh, with uh, Bob Kraft, Robert Kraft, the owner of the uh, New England Patriots, led a mission over to Israel some several years ago. And I was excited because I wanted to learn deeply about the Jewish roots of our faith. You know, as we know, the word says that faith is for the whosoever will to the Jew first and then to the Gentile, if you will. So, and it was fascinating. I ran into more people. I never knew that there were that many people that had gone over to birthright uh, over in Israel until I found out that I was going, but it helped me to dig deeper. So we need to be clear, crystal clear about who we're talking, who we're following, and hopefully if we are modeling as your people do, this is not a commercial. It'll come off as a commercial, but Pastor Dale, you are one of the finest Bible teaching teachers in the world, period. And if it were me, I, I, I was just sitting next to Antoinette, who just joined and got baptized here, the friends of the, of the friend of the Hell Migs here, and I asked her, well, how did you get to, to learn about this church? And it was through a friend of hers. Your people are the soul winners. You're teaching them. I have learned that Professing the faith is proclaiming the word of God, but it is teaching the faith that sustains all of us. And there's none finer than you in doing that. So that's what I've been trying to do is to make sure. I hope I answered your question. No, you did, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so let's just get really clear. Somebody's sitting here today and say, you know what? I'm not sure what it means to really be a Christian. Mm -hmm. I've thought about spirituality before. Obviously, I have some interest in God. You wouldn't even be here today if you didn't. Uh, so explain from your experience and your knowledge of Scripture, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It's, it's, it's multifaceted. It's all-inclusive. Just because somebody comes to church doesn't make them a Christian. There are many people who come to church who still aren't saved. They've not professed, confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They don't recognize God the Father, Abba Father, Yahweh, as Father. They haven't gotten to that point. So it is not church attendance. Although we understand in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 25, we all know it. Forsake not the gathering of yourselves, as is the manner of some, especially as we see the day fast approaching. Are we not either in that day or on the cusp night now, right now, with all the craziness that's going on out there? 
being a Christian, before the word Christian entered into the lexicon back whenever it was in biblical history, Pastor Dale, and you would teach us on that, we, those who followed Jesus Christ, were called followers of the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So if you're a Christian, you are a follower of the way. What is the way? It is incumbent. It is, is, it's in his word. It's uncovered in his word. So we need to make certain that we do that to know that we are Christians. Because I spoke at a major company several weeks ago, and one of the expressions that I continue to hear bandied about amongst everybody is, what is your truth? What is your truth? Well, let me tell you my truth. There's only one truth, period, from which all truth is derived. What we hear about in the world is the world's wisdom or truths that the so-called eggheads out here will try to perpetuate and promulgate. Please, you're human. You know nothing but what you learn in the word of God. I'm starting to preach. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. No, okay. That's why you're here. <laughs> the, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You said that a moment ago. And then he backed it up, not only by his death on the cross, but by his resurrection. And so being a follower of Jesus is not just choosing a way to say, oh, maybe that's one way to God. But Jesus proved that he was the son of God by his resurrection from the grave. Talk about that just for a moment. Proved that he was. You know, Pastor Dale is so good, so he helped me to get back on track here. <laughs> so you know you're a Christian if you're not an a la carte Christian. Example, going out to dinner, getting the menu, picking and choosing the items that you like, and discarding the ones that you don't. We are not a la carte Christians. We believe every jot and tittle in the Bible. The Bible says it is God breathed. Every word in the Bible is true. God's word is infallible. It is inerrant. And you're right, Jesus proved that. Even for those of you who are skeptics, um, the author, Lee Strobel, uh, the book entitled The Case for Christ. He was an um, atheist, and he used his investigative skills to go and research to see if the word is exactly what he said. And he didn't go in with a preconceived notion, but to be open, except that he was an atheist. Well, as he dug all through it from every perspective, he came to the undeniable conclusion that the word is what it says. In the book of Luke and in Acts, which he also wrote, Luke mentioned that there were, what, 32 countries, 54 cities, and nine islands that were in the word of God. There are people, including ex-presidents, who say that the Bible, well, it was written hundreds of years ago. It's outdated now. Outdated? Are you kidding me? Well, so Lee Strobel cited um, a highly esteemed archaeologist who went back to research and found every last one of those references in the Bible. That's just one sliver of it. But God, the Bible, I'll get to that later, but the Bible, the Old Testament, although it was interesting, I say this humorously, some of my Jewish friends with whom we were having Bible study, whenever I would say the Old Testament and the New Testament, they would say, the Testament, JB, the Testament, JB. So, but it was all good as we were helping each other learn and grow to that point. But you can't find one contradiction in the Bible. And those who read it carnally will see contradictions. But if you understand it spiritually, and that's where we learn from a teacher, there is no contradiction. A book, 66 books of the Bible, written over the course of what, 1,500 to 2,000 years, 40 different authors on, th on three different con continents, and there's not one, con you can't even play the game of telephone that we did as a little kid, got 10 people in the circle, somebody says something, by the time it gets around to the 10th person, it's radically different. That's in the here and now. Yeah. This was over 2,000 years, and there's not one contradiction, one theme, one central theme, grace and love, but redemption by not a redeemer, by the redeemer Amen. who came to do it. So praise God. I don't know what you put in my coffee this morning, but okay, so...
We have some more between services. We're going to give it back to you again. <laughs> yes, sir. Okay. James, there was a time in your life, and I know a little bit about your story, that, um, that you came to a place of really giving your life to Christ, of course. Your mom had a very strong faith. Your family had a strong faith. Uh, but there, that was not always true for you. Talk about the moment when you had a turning point in your life, and this became real to you, to James Brown, a relationship with Jesus in a personal way. And because you do know me so well, help me out, Pastor Dale, and I'll attempt to be very succinct. Um, I didn't know Jesus Christ when I was a youngster. My mother and father were awesome. They reminded me of Mary and Joseph in the Bible. My mother always wanted to be the excellent homemaker that she was. My father worked two and three jobs. He was a taxi cab driver and a prison guard at Lorton, which is no longer in existence. But they were hard working people. High school diplomas, I love to say they had PhDs in driving determination. But the one driving force was to really get to know God. I see how it worked through their lives. I was not saved at all. When I went to play professional basketball, drafted by the Atlanta Hawks, when I got cut and I knew that that was a mistake and the coach did and he acknowledged it after the fact later, I put the finger of blame on me because I failed to work as hard to stay on top as I did to get to the top. I was not gonna let that happen in a game of life. So I wanted to, and I remember after getting cut, I was hanging out with my athlete friends Again, cautionary tale because we weren't pursuing the same things, so I had to change relationships. And I was coming home, tooling home, didn't have um, that hot rod Cam uh, Camaro like um, like my friend Tim Helmick. I had I had a little Corvette, and I'm coming up the road at night, and I knew that was an empty lifestyle I was leading. I said, God, I've heard of you. I don't know you, but if you introduce yourself to me, I will serve you and show me that you're real. The very next week, I got an invitation, 24 years of age, to go to a pajama party. 24 years of age, a pajama party. I wasn't incorrigible, but I'll let your minds run wild. I figured after that, I felt like I had con committed high treason. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. That began a 12-year search for a good word-teaching church. You knew my bishop. As I got to know the word of God, that's when I got saved and gave my life to the Lord, dug into the word, and it changed my behavior. It changed my relationships. And perhaps the seminal moment was when I was out in Hollywood working, okay, at Fox Sports. And ath the world of athletics, tough, rough, you know, guys, and, you know, not suffering um, fools very, very kindly, if you will. And the guy said, hey, let's go hang out. And I'm not referencing necessarily the ones I work with on a set, so you got not get it twisted, as the young folks say. Um, but I got an invitation to go out to hang out and have some fun. Well, who doesn't want to have fun? But then they said, okay, we're going to go down to the best strip club in L.A. So now I'm at a decision point. Am I going to hang with them because they extended the invitation. I'm trying to ingratiate myself with a new team of co colleagues, or am I gonna follow the word of God? And I told him, thanks, but no thanks. And when he found out that I was going back to the condo to read the Bible, they knew, and young folk, I have no problems at this age today being called or thought of being square. I am cool with being square because Pastor Dale, Pastor Dale drug something out of me earlier, Miss Terry, that I didn't even know. It, it was definitely the Holy Spirit. I said, I think I said it. <laughs> I am okay with being square because I believe on standing squarely on the Word of God, which will put me on the right track. Praise God. So good, yeah. yeah. So James, your journey with Jesus obviously started in, in those moments. It was kind of a sequence, progressive event of really giving your life to Christ. And then you've developed your relationship with him. Talk about how does a person really grow a relationship with Jesus? You've grown with him over the years. What is involved in that process? What have you learned about being a growing Christian? I hope, um, hope I give a good example, Pastor Dale, to explain that. But it really is simply, let me put it back on you. I kept using this example because it really has become internalized. It's written on the tablet of my heart. You taught a series several years ago entitled Stronger, and you were encouraging the flock 
to use, especially those just getting out of school for the summer, to not waste your summer, but to grow in the Word of God. And you had a very simple formula that I've been blessed to share with other congregations and ministries around the country. And it is simply this, and it's so true. The point that I'm making is you grow by learning. And the word says in the book of James chapter 3, verse 1, I believe it is, Pastor Dale, that many ought not be teachers because their judgment will be more critical. So teachers have a serious responsibility to teach the word of God right. But that little equation that you gave in that series stronger said, if you truly embrace learning about God, get to know God. And if you get to know God and know his true nature, you will trust him. If you trust him, you will want to be obedient to him. And if you're obedient to him, you will be blessed by him. You said limited knowledge leads to limited trust. Limited trust leads to limited obedience. Limited obedience leads to limited promises. Trust God because he is trustworthy. He says it in his word. In the book of Numbers, chapter 23 and verse, uh, verse 19, um, pastor, was it the uh, king whose name was Balak? Um, and, and then there was the prophet uh, who was Balaam, who loved to do, if you will, miracles, not miracles, or seek the word of God to bless that population because they were concerned about all the Israelites around them, knowing that they were a mighty people governed by God. And he says, can you go? I want you to curse the Israelites. And he said, I can only do what God tells me. And he tried it three times to go back to God. And when he came back, God told him, Balaam, you go back and tell that king, I am not a man that I can lie nor am I the son of man that I should repent. Have I not said it? Will it not come to pass? Have I not spoken it? Will it not manifest? To me, in today's vernacular, that means don't mess with God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did I answer your question, oh, you Pastor? Did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So right. wonderfully. And so I'm going to kind of sh shift gears just a little bit here. Obviously, we live as Christians in a world that is opposed to Christ, oftentimes opposed to truth, opposed to the Bible. Uh, and of course, Jesus said that we're in the world, but we're not to be of the world. Our world today, uh, our culture, our, our, our nation, and literally around the world, I believe it's probably the case, is more divided than it's ever been before, divided by all kind of issues. And um, how do we stand for truth without being obnoxious? How do we stand for truth in a way that builds bridges it doesn't destroy bridges, but builds them, but at the same time doesn't compromise truth. You're, you're in a world that I think puts a significant amount of pressure on you in that regard. Talk about how you navigate being a Christian that is in the world, but not of the world. Pastor, and I hope I'll answer it properly with hopefully these two specific points. Um, one, I would hope that over the many years that the Lord has blessed me to be in the media, that people know who I am. A square, yes, okay, but that I love the Lord and I lead with the love of Jesus. My company over the many years I've been there has asked me a number of times to deliver commentaries on issues of the day that still impact sports. So I'm not trying to take them, although there are many people who are strictly focused on sports. Why are you talking about this, man? I'm just tuning in to watch a football game and to enjoy. Where are you going? You know what? The second point to that is this. I know that my boss didn't hire me to proselytize, didn't hire me to bring people as a witness to Jesus Christ. However, you can model it. And is it, what we said, St. Francis of Assisi, who said many people would prefer to see a good sermon before they want to hear a good sermon. So I tried to model that. And many of the um, commentaries that I've dealt with have dealt with issues of the day, whether it's the lack of African-American head coaches who can do the job because of a stereotype, unfortunately, that they just can't, they don't have leadership skills and qualities. Thank God Tony Dungy tore that one down big time. Or they think that women can't be in the C-suite executive positions running an organization. Excuse me, the last time I read the Bible, it says God says he came and he tore down the middle wall of petition so there's no longer Jew, Jew or Greek, if you will, or Gentile 
now, male or female, bond or free. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Women can do the job equal, if not better. And then recently, you know, but I'm supposed to stand on truth. And when I was looking at the rise of anti-Semitism that's going on in the country and the rise of hate, well, you know what? If God's word is the truth for the whosoever will, I'm not supposed to stay in one little silo and speak only on here. So I talked about the rise in anti-Semitism. When I went over to Israel and went to, oh gosh, I forgot to ask Claudia. So I know it's called the Yad Vashem, uh, the, the, Holocaust, the Holocaust there, but next door is the memorial for the kids. Shoes teeth, clothing from kids, man's inhumanity to man knows no boundaries. That's hurtful. So yeah, I get shot at from a number of different people. I don't care because this is what the word says. I'm supposed to stand on his word. In today's society, we've got such a wide chasm and a deep one where people are not speaking to each other, they're shouting vitriol, vitriol, spewing hate at each other. The Bible says a house divided can't stand. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? The word of God, the truths of God, the maxims of God have applicable practical applications across the spectrum. I understand the context within which those things were said, but the application runs across the spectrum. More people are wed to their political affiliation, their ideologies, than the love of man and each other, as God says. First commandment is what? Love God the Father with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you. I don't see much love, so I'd better model that and walk that. Now, even though I wasn't hired to proselytize, if somebody asks me, now I've got license to speak the word. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. I want to bring our, our conversation to a, a conclusion here in just a moment, but I want to do so by, again, shifting gears just a little bit. I know just from our interaction a bit this year that this has been a tough year for you and the fact that you lost your brother, okay, Everett. And, uh, of course, Everett uh, had a, a journey with his life, a spiritual journey, a difficult uh, number of years that he, he battled with some things I'll have you talk about in just a moment, but came through with victory at the end. Talk about your brother Everett, the lessons from his life, and the, the victories that you saw God bring about in his life. The flock here at Church of the Redeemer played a hand in it. It underscores in the athletic vernacular a team-oriented effort that all of us are involved in in helping one another, especially those you see who are struggling. In the book of Ephesians, chapter... 4 and 16, is it, Pastor, um, that says that in talking about the human body, one body with many different members, every joint supplies. And you guys played that role. You specifically, with your teaching and your application of the word, helped my brother. 38 years, he battled drug addiction. 38 years. Numerous times, he should have been taken out and been a statistic. I saw the hurt in him that came as a result of an unfaithful wife. And as a youngster, he had approval addiction needs. He was watching pornography. He was hanging with the wrong people. Evil communications corrupts good manners. All influencing him, but we didn't stop praying. Prayer is powerful. Examples are powerful. You need to, and if you're struggling with any of these things, it is the word of God that changes. How do you say that? I know it from example and experience. My brother went through eight different drug treatment programs. When he was going to his ninth drug treatment program, he was planning his rehab after the rehab because he had stashed his drugs in a hideaway spot that he was gonna come back to after he went through another drug treatment program until Pastor Tony Evans down in Dallas, Texas, where the young men who were in that rehab program went to his church. He sent him to a, a rehab center in uh, New Jersey whose only book that was used was the Bible. They told him he could not bring anything else in there but the Bible. He went through that program and came out sold out for Christ. 
burned those drugs. And yes, he had all kinds of morbidities, eight serious medical challenges. Anyone that can knock him out, including bladder cancer, had his leg amputated. His testimony is on YouTube, Everett Brown testimony. I didn't know half of what he was saying about the approval addiction and the addiction to pornography and all. But the word of God delivered when he, in his interview that he did with Tony Evans, when he was asked, what was the difference? He said, it is the word of God that changed me. Number two, what was key? Surrendering to the word of God. And three, helping others because helping others with the word of God helped him. When he was went after numerous visits to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore for all kinds of issues, when it was he was heading down the home stretch, taken to Sinai Hospital in hospice care. When he went there, he said, I felt the Lord was here. So while he ran his race, stumbled many times along the way, fell down, he finished well, and to God be the glory, he is in the presence of the Lord now. So, so as we're concluding here today, James, would you just talk to, to all of us here today about that, that, that word surrender? What does it mean to surrender? And maybe there's someone here, maybe several today that have never taken that step in their life. Encourage us in that process of surrender. Instruct us. What does that mean? One has to totally submit to God. So many people today have a performance-based mentality. That was in the Old Testament under the law. That was pointing to the coming of Jesus when the law was introduced to show to us that we could not do it on our own. We needed a savior. The law was not evil. The law was God's way of showing you can't do it yourself. My wife and I just got back from vacation down in Jamaica, and it was awesome because as we were sitting on the beach reading the word, people were coming by, are you guys pastors? Are you such and such? She led, she took the lead role in leading two piece people to Christ. And it was because they surrendered. Your praise and worship team, I'll close in this. I love the lines, the lyrics in the praise songs that they were singing, talking about our God. Our God is the God of the impossible. What looks like a dead end to us is nothing but an opportunity for God. When the Jews were being led by Moses out of Israel, they got to the Red Sea, trapped by mountains on either side, the Romans coming back to recapture them, and the Red Sea in front of them. God said, be still and see that I am Lord. The enemy you see today, you will not see again. He parted the Red Sea for them, and they went across. But the moral is here. When the, with the folks trying to recapture them, the Roman soldiers tried to come behind them, a miracle that is intended for you is your miracle. It drowned them and it freed the Jews when they went across. Now, I remember, and I promise I'm not going to preach for 30 seconds and say this, because I read in the USA Today, and I said it here several years ago, an article in op-ed saying that, hey, wait a minute, they're trying to make that sound like it was a miracle. Let me tell you something. There were atmospheric conditions back then that would have the Red Sea down to either three feet, some say as low as three inches. So that wasn't a miracle. Well, here's where we need to know the Word of God. Don't let them get away because Jesus said we're being tested. But it is also written that that all of the army that came behind them drowned. If they drowned in three inches of water or three feet of water, that's a miracle in my book all day long. Hallelujah. So that's what we're supposed to do. So I've set up one of the best teachers to say, if you don't know this Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, listen to one of the finest teachers, surrender and give your life to God and watch what he can do with it. To God be the glory. You put the espresso in my coffee and I'm sorry. So anyway. <laughs> Stay right here with me, sir. Yes, sir. Let's bow our heads together, if you will. Every head bowed, every eye closed just for these next couple of moments. Maybe you've never surrendered your life to God. Maybe you've never done what James just talked about. You've never said, Jesus, come into my life. Jesus is real. He is alive. He not only died on the cross, but he rose from the grave. He proved that he was the son of God. He's the savior of the world. 
He'll be your savior today if you'll open your heart to him. You say, how do I do that? It's called prayer. It's just opening your heart in prayer to him. And I want to lead you in a prayer. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, whether you're here in this worship center today, in our Frederick Worship Center, maybe you're watching online, wherever you might be, this is your moment right now to receive Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life, to surrender to him. Would you pray these words with me right now? It's right where you are. Whisper the name Jesus. You're talking to him. Say, Jesus, go ahead and do it. Don't be afraid. He wants to hear from you today. Just whisper his name, Jesus. I know that I'm a sinner. I've done so many wrong things in my life. I'm so very sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. Tell him that right now. I believe in you. I believe you are the Son of God, the Savior. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave that you're alive. I believe in you, Jesus. Now, would you pray this prayer very simply right now? Say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. Ask him in right now. Come into my life. Forgive me for all of my sins. Today, I turn my life over to you. In Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray. And you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus... I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time.